Ducky Ducky universe puts you in control of a robot trying to understand humans. There's not much in it as far as gameplay goes, and what there is is really repetitive. But the fact of the matter is that Ducky Ducky universe is completely hysterical. The game's writing is borderline insane, and the quizzes seem totally off the wall, until it gives you back strangely accurate, or not, personality readings. The gameplay might be dull, but only one game this year had me riding a flying beaver wearing a top hat through the universe while being asked if I would prefer an octopus or a baby for a hat. And I love Ducky Ducky Universe for being that game. You can always count on Nintendo to reinvent their franchises without losing what made them great in the first place. Well, most of the time. A link between worlds doesn't reinvent the wheel or anything, but it's different enough to be interesting. There's not much in terms of universe building, but what there is is mechanically sound and extremely intricate, which makes a link between worlds probably the most fun Zelda game to play in years. Past the totally dumb but endearing humor of Guacamole, there is a surprising amount of depth in its gameplay. The game throws some pretty difficult combat and platforming sequences at you on, forcing the player to use all their hard-earned luchador skills in tandem. But what makes Guacamole so fun is the near-perfect pace the game ends out these skills. That and the great art style that makes you feel like the most awesome luchador to ever walk the hurt, beside El Santo. Space is a terrifying and ominous place. Well, it seems to be. For me, anyway. The Swapper is at its best when it's making you feel that cold isolation. And for most of the game, the only people you meet are clones of yourself. Clones the game forces you to kill repeatedly. It is a dark and somewhat disturbing case of mechanics reinforcing the theme. In terms of gameplay, what's there is tender but well designed. The general atmosphere of the game makes it something truly special. GTA V might be the most expensive video game world ever realized, as impressive in scope as it seems to be a completely egotistical project. It is a world made by a bunch of controlled freaks. The only solution that Rockstar has found to the limits of the video game medium is money. The game is riddled with problems and the script is often condescending, but at the same time, the vision here is unparalleled. That's it! Now we gotta bring it over to Bay F! It is an impressive game. With its jazzy soundtrack and its trench coat wearing protagonist, Gunpoint is the best at making you feel like a spy. Not one of those John le Carré soporific spy though, but a cool film noir-esque spy with the capacity to jump surprisingly high. Gunpoint's minimalistic visuals and word building ensures that it always hits home. It is a small game that feels complete. It made me feel smart too, and that is probably because it is smarter than I really am. Inukuni might only be this high on my list because I share the name of the protagonist, Oliver, which made me relate to him more easily than I should have. That being said, the game is beyond gorgeous. The world is expensive and is a joy to explore, just for the sheer beauty of it. Sadly, the game is not mechanically up to par with its visuals. It is enjoyable for sure, but the confused combat system and the mostly roadside quest bored me later in the game. Luckily, the story makes up for it. It is an ultra naive affair, but it's so earnest that I just couldn't resist it. Whereas normally cat puns would make me roll my eyes in content, while playing Nino Kuni, I welcome them all. Every single one. Those were purely moments. Um. The representation of women in video games has been one of the biggest subjects of the year, and maybe not for the best reason. I'm personally glad that finally we're seeing some progress on that front, and Gone On might be the best video game to represent that this year. Limiting it as a social feminist agenda game would be diminutive though, it has so much more to offer. It presents a perfectly created and coherent universe contained in a small but hyper detailed house. The story seems like a typical teenager's affair, but the way it uses tropes and subverts the usual video game cynicism to surprise its players is something I will remember for a long time.
Papers, Please is the most stressful game I've played this year. It is an innocuous but kind of dreary looking thing that terrified me as much as I enjoyed it. It feels like an Arendt's banality of evil theory made into a game, and it shows wonderfully that gameplay can indeed inform story and emotion. As in real life, it is often way harder to make good than just ignore everything and be mean because it is your job. That was not my choice. I tried to help the revolution. I got shot for it. At least I tried. This game is something dear to me. It is not even finished and might not ever be. Which would be ironic seeing how oh, the second episode does a bunch of direct references to Kafka. But what exists is enough to earn my top spot. What Kentucky Route Zero does different and, for me, better than any other game that came before it, is cooperative storytelling. By making most of its choices implied instead of explicit, it gives agency to the player through his own imagination. While the game will not change much between playthroughs, it opens up a ton of possible stories that are to the player to determine. It is a beautiful game that asks a lot of its players, but rewards them accordingly. Kentucky Route Zero is easily my best game of the year. Jesus.